Thank you for your good words. I see that you are basically div divided into two groups. The group of the ones who would like to have a nap now and will be <laughs> able to have it. And the other group that might find it more difficult because they are jet lagged. <laughs> but I am going to produce a reductio ad unum and everybody will be able to speak. Uh, the topic I have been given is somehow broad, and I'm going to say a few things. First, why should also theologians raise the question of God in philosophical terms? The first reason for that is not proper to theologians. There is first a general reason why it is interesting to speak about God in philosophy. And to say it with the words of Cornelio Fabro, Italian Thomistic philosopher, the search for God is the most authentic sign of a life of a mind, because in regard to God, any time of history, the various civilization and the individual consciences reflect themselves as the absolute measure of their own relation to truth. What does it mean? If you want to know who a person is or who a group or a community or a culture is, look at the relation of that person or community to God. And he gives a good argument for, to explain why it is important. It gives the absolute measure of our own relation to truth. We must put both things together for several reasons. One of them, to say the least, is that front of God, it is really difficult to lie. We must see who we really are. And that has an impact on everything else. Then another reason to speak about God has been provided by Peter Kreeft, or Kreeft, some people say, because he was of Dutch origin, like Roosevelt, you know. That has an impact on the way the name is said. And he said, the idea of God is either a fact or a fantasy. But if it is a fantasy, something invented by human beings, it is the greatest invention ever. Because no idea has ever had such an impact on people, on history. And if you want a proof of that, try to Imagine history to try, try to understand history without God. You see, you just take one person out of a story. According to who the person is, it will change more or less. Take God out of history, and you will not understand anything anymore. Therefore, it means that it is an interesting topic. At least, even if we were not believers, and in this regard, you might be only one group. Then. Another point has been raised by the Italian atheist philosopher Paolo Flores d'Arcais, who said in 2000, is the church still interested in God? Because when we try to find people who could reply, who would reply to our arguments about God, does God exist? We don't find them. What we find is many people who say, Thanks to my faith, or my faith gives a meaning to my life. All right, it's meaningful to them, but when we ask them whether it is true or not, they don't reply, they think that the question is not interesting anymore. But then it might perfectly be that it is an illusion which is some kind of opium that people would like to have because it helps them. So at least for these reasons, I think that it is interesting that even philosophically we think about God. And that would apply also to non-believers or to non-Christians. Then theologians, Catholic theologians specifically, but even not Catholic theologians, should they think philosophically <coughs> about God? Well. Aquinas, not the one who nicely introduced me, but another one, <laughs> said 
The teaching of the Christian faith treats of creatures in so far as they reflect a certain likeness of God, and for as much as error concerning them leads to error about God. This is a powerful statement. If we misunderstand the world, generally speaking, that is very likely to lead to some mistakes about God. Of course, it doesn't mean yet that philosophically we must think about God, simply that we should try to have a correct kind of knowledge. About the question why theologians can't avoid philosophy whether they want or not, John Paul II wrote his encyclical, Fides et Ratio, where he says several things first. Faith requires, so that its object is understood, the help of reason. Not only faith. The Bible can't be understood if we can't have access to truth, a real knowledge of reality. So revelation itself would simply be impossible. But then he says, were theologians to refuse the help of philosophy, they would run the risk of doing philosophy unwittingly and locking themselves within thought structures poorly adapted to the understanding of faith. In other words, if a theologian, a believer generally speaking, for instance, thinks that he can read the Bible and have immediate access to it because his mind in some kind of tabula rasa, it will simply mean that he will mix with the Bible, with what he reads, ideas that he has in his mind without being conscious of that, and that might not be well adapted. In this sense, it is not possible to avoid the impact of some philosophy on our faith, and we should rather try to have the, the impact of something which is compatible. Then John Paul II went on saying, that philosophy is indispensable for the sake of communicating the truth of the gospel to those who do not yet know it. And sometimes it is one of the, the few tools we have for a dialogue with people who are not believers. And we should also be able to say something about God in this regard. I notice in my new uh, line of work that I have to meet teenagers who prepare their confirmation, for instance, and I'm quite impressed to see that in many cases their questions are more philosophical than theological. And uh, I take an example that impressed me some time ago. A teenage girl of Portuguese origin, recent immigrant, told me, how do I reply to my school friends who tell me why do you believe in something you don't see? If this is not a philosophical question, do theology students learn that? Learn answer to such questions? They should, because it makes perfect sense to ask the question. Then, before I speak about St. Thomas, I will try to suggest something which some people do not notice, although all of you know it already, namely, when he thought about what philosophy could do for theologians or believers, he did not simply introduce something completely new, some kind of rationalism uh, after the golden age of the fathers who had a more spiritual theology. I remember something that quite surprised me. I went to speak to the only Orthodox University of Russia some four years ago, something like that. And one of the uh, professors, in the, when they asked questions after my, my lecture, told me, oh, you know, we have a problem with Aquinas here. It is that we, with his distinction between faith and reason, he introduced the idea of double truth, which is very dangerous. I suggested that it was not very accurate. And not only that, that he was simply not the first one, because people before him were already able to put two ideas together. 
uh, one of the best examples would be St. Justin. Of course, he is supposed to be the first Christian philosopher, so it, it's not it's a good idea to quote him. And he says, I boast with all my strength strive to be found a Christian, not because the teachings of Plato are different from those of Christ, but because they are not in all respects similar, as neither are those of the others, Stoics and poets and historians. Interesting distinction, it is not that philosophers do something which is either completely different or totally similar. In part different, in part similar. But each man spoke well in proportion to the share he had of a spermatic world, seeing what was related to it. But they do contradict themselves on the more important points. But they who contradict themselves on the more important points appear not to have possessed the heavenly wisdom. And then, of course, philosophers sometimes contradict themselves. Then he says, whatever things were rightly said among all men are the property of us Christians. Because we are the disciples of Christ, to make it short. St. Augustine, later on, as you might know, um, said also that wh whatever truth he had found in the Platonists, was combined in St. Paul with the exaltation of divine grace. And when he also says two things, for instance, well, in the works of the philosophers, something is missing, namely the work of grace in relation to a contrite heart. We find the same idea in Pascal, for instance, most probably due to the influence of St. Augustine, obviously. Then the same Augustine goes on saying, well, if those who are called philosophers, and especially the Platonists, have said uh, that is true and in harmony with our faith, we are not only not to shrink from it, but to claim it for our own use from those who have unlawful possession of it because basically it belongs to us. The same line is in Justin, and for the same reason. And he uh, goes on saying their garments, that is human institutions, such as are adapted to that intercourse, we must take and turn to a Christian use. So we do not only take from them some ideas, but also some institutions that can be useful. And people would say that the church is organized uh, with some, the help of some pagan institutions. Well, why not? If they are good as a way of organizing human life, why not? Says St. Augustine, if I understand him correctly. Then Aquinas. I just summarize because you know that, but I would say, I would just say it is in continuity with the church fathers whom I quoted, and I could have quoted more. Between what we learn with natural reason and from revelation, there is no contradiction. I don't insist on that because I'm sure that you know it already. Then if we know God in philosophical terms, that means that it is part of our natural reason the philosopher considers things as belong to them, generally speaking, not only God, as belong to them by their own nature, and the believer as belong to consider things in them or in respect to their, of their relation to God. That means the philosopher relates things to their first cause, and not only to their, if I may say, created causes. But I don't insist on that because I want to say a little bit more about other things and I should not waste your time by repeating things that you know only too well. But speaking about our philosophical knowledge of God, Aquinas says, for instance, and you know that it will be repeated by uh, Vatican I, Deiphilius, there are things that we can't know about God in philosophy. 
such as the knowledge of a trinity. And then he says, well, if some try to prove the trinity of persons by natural reason, they derogate from faith in two ways. First, as regards the dignity of faith itself, which consists in its being concerned with invisible things that exceed human reason. Secondly, as regards the utility of drawing others to the faith. For when anyone in the endeavor to prove the faith brings forward reasons that are not cogent, he falls under the ridicule of the unbelievers. So we should be careful not to try to prove philosophically what can't be proved for the reasons indicated here and also because we might give the impression that our God can be invented by human beings, for instance. But when Aquinas and others say there are some things that we can't prove with reason and receive only through faith, that leads to some objections. One of the objections has been summarized by Louis Anthony, contemporary American philosopher who invited a whole group to write with her why they don't believe in God. And she says, if a doctrine can be defended on rational grounds, then it needn't be taken on faith. But if it can't be defended on rational grounds, why should you believe it? You see, there is a double objection there. If you can argue philosophically about God, you don't need faith. But if you can't argue on the basis of reason about something, why should you believe it? There is some elements of answer in what Aquinas says, and this is quoted again by Deifilius. The reason why faith is good and in a way necessary for uh, our knowledge of what can be known without faith, that means by natural reason, is that the knowledge of divine truth would be quicker, more general, that means shared by more people, and uh, safer with more certitude. After these general statements, which are more uh, summary than uh, an analysis, I will summarize some elements of another question that means does God exist? This is also an interesting question if we speak philosophically about God. Can we address this question? And how far? Well, Vatican II in Gaudium et Spes 21 says, speaks about the poisonous doctrines and actions, that means atheism, which contradict reason and the common experience of humanity and dethrone men from his native excellence. So if you deny the existence of a God, you are speaking against reason, against the experience of humanity and against human dignity. If you think about it, that's quite powerful because atheists tend to claim exactly the opposite of that. Why would be some argument in favor of the existence of God necessary? Because in the first place, God is not evident to us. And St. Thomas has to argue in favor of that statement as he does. Because to some, God is self-evident. And he gives arguments against that such as the opposite of a proposition God is can be mentally admitted. The fool said in his heart there is no God, therefore that God exists is not self-evident. Such a statement, which is quite simple, is interesting in more ways than one, probably in two ways. First, he uses the Bible to argue in favor of that. But then, even though he probably lived in a world where people tended to be rather believers, he did not confuse his own situation with the human mind, generally speaking, and that's not very easy. And in another text in the Summa Contra Gentes, in that case, 111, speaking again, again about the opinion that God would be self-evident, he says, the foregoing opinion arose from their being accustomed from, from the beginning 
to hear and call upon the name of God. He's able to take some distance. So, oh yes, of course. A monk, as everybody is accustomed to speak about God, it doesn't mean that it is evident. And then, it is also a result of failing to distinguish between what is self-evident simply and that which is self-evident to us. Because, of course, nothing is more evident to God. No, nothing is more evident than God, but to God. Simply, we are a little bit more limited, much more limited. And then he says, it is not known to all, even to those who grant that there is a God, that God is that thing that than which no greater can be thought of, since many of the ancients asserted that this world is God. Even without thinking about in Anselm, would say, if a God were evident, there would be less mistakes about him. <coughs> Probably. So, an argument is useful, but is it possible? This is another question. We have reasons of faith to think that it is possible. And I am thinking about one of the most famous, but not the only possible texts from the Bible, namely the first chapter of a letter to the Romans. Some would say that it is an exception in the Bible uh, and that we can't simply use one verse to build a whole natural theology. Well, nevertheless, St. Paul says about pagans, he's speaking about them there, and he was in a bad mood that day. Well, they know them. They know God, because God has shown himself to them ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived with the intellect in the things that have been made. He doesn't claim that we see God. He says that if we think about what we see, we have a means to know something about God, eternal power and deity. But he does not stop there. He goes on saying, well, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions and he makes a list of them. What does it mean? If it is not really possible to know God, God judged in a way which is not just, unfair. To say to people, I condemn you because you didn't do it in any case you couldn't, that would not be very nice. So the text truly really suggests that we have to choose between the possibility of some natural knowledge of God and a God who is not just. If it is better if he's just for us also. And St. Thomas supposed that there were possible ways to prove the existence of God. We will always find people who interpret via in terms of way and not prove and suggest that uh, St. Thomas carefully chose a word which is not supposed to be a proof, but there are actually many texts where he speaks about that. And for instance, in the De Veritate, question 10, article 12, he said that the existence of God has been proved by the philosophers with unimpeachable proofs, demonstrationibus irrefragabilibus. Although trivial reasons have also been brought forth. So what is the status of possible arguments in favor of the existence of God? They are not articles of faith, but preambles to the articles. For faith presupposes natural knowledge, even as grace presupposes nature. This is quite a powerful statement, because we tend to like the idea that uh, gratia supponit naturam, when we see that people are simply too disturbed in their nature to be able to have a balanced type of religious life, for instance. But the other element is also uh, what John Paul II will say, will say later. If we can't know something about God on the basis of our knowledge of his world, that's going to lead to some problems in our faith. And a little bit later, in the same uh, question two, article two of the Prima Pars, uh, 
at Dertium from effects not proportionate to the cause, no perfect knowledge of that cause can be obtained. Yet from every effect the existence of a cause can be clearly demonstrated. That replies to some arguments. We do not know God com perfectly well on the basis of a philosophical reasoning. Yes, that's true. But we can affirm that there are no effects without cause. Then he replies to arguments in the Summa Contra Gentes 1.12, arguments against the possibility to prove the existence of God. He says, they say that it is impossible by means of a reason to discover that God exists and that this knowledge is acquired solely by means of faith and revelation. Well, you see the fideism uh, condemned by Vatican I in a sense, in other words. In making this assertion, some were moved by the weakness of the arguments which certain people employed to prove the existence of God. I don't have to comment on that. Then a more crucial objection. In God, essence and existence are the same. We can't know his essence, therefore we can't know his existence. That comes back from time to time in a debate about the existence of God. I remember that I read a debate between an Australian atheist whose name I don't remember now, but I could find it, and a theistic philosopher. The Australian said, at least he teaches in Australia, he said, um, well, I have one argument which is enough. It is always dangerous to say one argument is enough, by the way. Uh, he said, one argument is enough you agree that, and all mystics also say we can't really say who God is. In other words, we can't know the essence of God. So when you say, when you use the word God in a sentence, you don't understand the sentence. Therefore, it is absurd. And the other one replied to him, well, listen, if I tell you God created the world, you might not believe in God, but you will understand the, se the sentence and argue against it. If I tell you I created the world, you will see the difference. That means that you know at least enough of a meaning that the word God can have to see whether a sentence is more or less meaningful. That's a good point. It was somehow the same argument already mentioned by St. Thomas, who then goes on saying, our knowledge even of things which transcend the senses originates from the senses. A good disciple of Aristotle. If we want to speak about God, we need first a certain knowledge of his world. Because, and it is an interesting question, I am not completely sure about some of its elements, but without words, how could we think about God? It is not uncommon to find people who would say, of course I believe in God, but I, you know, I don't have the words to speak about it. Well, the result is that they don't think much about it. Because it's difficult, and not only when it's about God. It's difficult to think if you don't know a language. Then one of the reasons to speak about God, and why we can't really avoid the question whatever we think about the answer, is what I would call the, the experience of contingency. You see, St. Augustine in Ostia, looking at the countryside with his mother, says, oh, let's listen to what things say. Let's be silent also within our mind. What do they say? We created not ourselves. This is the experience of contingency. Aquinas says something similar in other words, namely, anything that can be and not be needs something else before itself which makes it exist. Therefore, there is something before any being which can be or not be, but there is nothing before God. This is the experience of contingency. Everything we see could be or not be. How does that make sense? And to say it with Giuseppe de Rosa, Italian Jesuit, who gave a short argument about that, summary, 
The channel that carries water can be infinitely long, but if the source is missing, there will be no water in the channel. That should at least come as a question to us. You may add many members to the universe, but if you think about it, you can't really avoid wondering why there is something greater than nothing. The fact that the universe is very big is a way of avoiding us. Our brother Simon Tagwell, and I'm looking at some member of his province, you see that I care about England also, said, uh, wrote something which is actually rather interesting. Once I told him I liked that and he had forgotten that he had written it. <laughs> For Thomas, it is not really the mar marvelous complexity and ingenuity of things that alerts the mind to the reality of God. It is rather the metaphysical implications of very simple observations about things, beginning with a primary fact of their being there at all. We should notice that as something surprising. Speaking about English people, Anthony Kenny also wrote about God. I see that I have a balanced view about the contribution of England. <laughs> and he said, you are a traitor, you know, because you, you are not, you, you should have more solidarity with English people. <laughs> I don't comment on that. <laughs> so, Anthony Kenny, the cosmological argument must depend on necessary, not contingent features of a kind of cosmos to be explained. Otherwise, they will be vulnerable to defeat by the progress of science. What does that mean? If you want to argue about God, you should not take contingency as your starting point. Otherwise, you are going to build on sand, and as our knowledge of contingent realities is in constant evolution, it's, these arguments are not going to last. Or another English example, Robin Lupois de Vin, English, although he has a beautiful name, and who uh, teaches um, philosophy of religion, in, I think, in Leeds, and that shows that we must think about the meaning we give to words, says, the universe is all that there is. Think about it. The universe is all that there is. Interesting definition. There is nothing outside it. Consequently, there is nothing to point to as a cause of the universe's existence. In other words, if you accept that the universe is all that there is and include God into that, then of course you can't find the cause of the universe. You have to suggest that God is not part of the universe and that the universe is all that, uh, that, that is in some way contingent. Of course, one speaking about contingency could add, we like André Comte Sponville. In this case, he's not English, not yet at least. People can change, you know. What makes us think that there is no such thing as the absolutely inexplicable? Why should contingency not have a last word of a final silence? Because it would be absurd, so what? Why shouldn't the truth be absurd? And he goes on by saying, in any case, if you want to explain why there is something, you, the existence of being could be explained only by entities that are. In other words, we would need to assume what we are attempting to explain. Once again, he puts somehow God within contingent beings on top of saying that the world could be absurd. But in all these arguments, that presuppose that we can't find any cause of the whole universe because anything we will find is contingent in any case. God made the world, who made God? Kind of question. St. Thomas says, if God is not his own existence, he will not be essential but participated being. He will not therefore be the first being, which is absurd. What does it mean? When we speak about God, we do not mean a contingent being. And one of the reasons why we do not mean a contingent being is that if everything is contingent, we don't understand anything. It needs something different. There was um, 
a debate after a public lecture by Richard Dawkins somewhere in the south of the United States in the Bible Belt, you know. And he said that there is no God, which is his favorite topic, and then replied to questions that were usually a little bit weak, unfortunately, such as we have the archaeological proof that the world is only 7,000 years old or things like that. And he could dismiss these questions and it was, of course, a little bit disturbing to me to watch that until somebody said, why don't you take into consideration the possibility that what we call God might be a being who doesn't, who doesn't need a cause? And that made him completely angry. This is completely absurd. I thought, uh, I don't know why he's angry. I, don't, I really don't know. But in a sense, the whole set of objects of his scientific inquiry is contingent. So it might be simply that. Or he might have seen that he can't reply to the question. Why don't you take that into consideration, simply? If what you use in your sentence with the name God is actually a contingent being, we are not speaking about the same thing. And part of the purpose is to go out of that chain. But Consponville said, Can we, uh, why wouldn't we be absurd? Why wouldn't we be absurd? It's a good question. Well, St. Thomas says about that, According to the philosopher, the ultimate end of human life is the contemplation of God. If then man could not achieve that, he would be constituted as a vain being. You know that Aristotle thinks that uh, what nature does is not vain. St. Thomas agrees with that. But you might say, well, it's not a proof. Another argument by St. Thomas, our intellect reaches the infinite in understanding. Now it would be a sign of which is that given any finite quantity, our intellect can imagine a greater. Now it would be to no purpose for the intellect to be thus directed to the infinite unless there were infinite intelligible being. And then he also speaks about our desire for beatitude and things like that. Well, you could say, well, it is what he would like. Does it mean that it is true? About that, the Scottish philosopher Joel Haldane says, not every desire has an actual satisfier answering to the description of the intentional object of that desire, which means in other words, the fact that we would like something to be true does it mean that, doesn't mean that it is true. Aquinas does not argue, he goes on, to God's existence from the natural desire of God, because that desire is a composite of a natural desire to know, achieved through causal reasoning. In other words, he doesn't say, we would like God to exist, therefore he exists. Haldane says, Aquinas reaches that point from the starting point of causal reasoning. And he says, Haldane, a direct argument from desire would presuppose what it set out to establish, but that does not mean that natural desires are irrelevant to the case of God, for God, since the existence of such desires imply the existence of their correlates, and that order of teleology as well as a particular epistemic desire is the sort of thing that calls for an explanation at least try to say why we have a desire in us and why the world exists at the same time. He says, he, a little bit later in the same text of Haldane, St. Thomas points to features of what is experienced that are explained by the hypothesis of Taysom, but otherwise go unaccounted for. For instance, also the very fact of the dynamic structure of thought and desire by which we are led both to incline to one's belief and to desire that to which belief has inclined us. So if we want to understand the world as it is and the fact that we think about the world and we are somehow by our thought oriented towards the world, how do we explain that? Much better with God than without God. Because 
as, to go back to England, Richard Swinburne also said, do not take arguments in isolation to each other. Take them together. You see, if it is a mistake of the atheist to reduce his all view to one argument, because that argument can be contradicted, that applies also to people who want to argue in favor of the existence of God. One argument is not enough. Let's take several ones. And then, as Aldane said, that th this way we will understand the world better than we would without the hypothesis of God. About the question of our desire as related to God, we could say, or it could be wishful thinking, and this is dangerous. The same Conce Pauville already mentioned said, one of the main reasons why I believe that there is no God is that I would like God to exist. But something which would fulfill so well my desires is rather suspect to my mind. And Plantinga somehow replies to that by saying, well, of course, it, it is related to what we desire. But does it mean that it is not true? Because simply to say it is with Freud and others, we would like that to be like, we would like these, therefore it is wrong, that remains to be proved. Because after all, if a God made us, it would make sense that he also makes us towards him, fetishinos ad tem, and that therefore actually he fulfills our desires. That would be a good reason why we desire him. But that also points to the role of a will in our statements about God. To the role of a will in faith, for instance, but not only. In the um, De Veritate 14.1, St. Thomas says, quoting St. Augustine, Man can do other things unwillingly, but he can believe only if he wills it. You can't believe, it means here it is about the act of faith itself, because you don't have enough intellectual evidence. You can believe only if you want it. Good. In a sense, although he doesn't say that about the philosophical knowledge of God, there is also an impact of our will in our philosophical reasoning, although not exactly the same one. And when I say that, I am happy to quote Pius XII in his encyclical Humani Generis, where he raises a question, namely, we have a natural ability to know that God exists and some of his attributes and some elements of natural law. So do we have this ability since some actually, although they have a human uh, nature, don't achieve it? Oh, there are problems. We are able, but it's difficult nevertheless, because the object is a little bit too high, but also because of our desires. To accept that God exists implies perhaps some change in our life, the kind of thing which is sometimes described as conversion. We might not want it. It calls for self-surrender and abnegation, he says. And he goes on saying, so it happens that people in such matters easily persuade themselves that what they would not like to be true is false or at least doubtful. Certainly, this is a point. When we think about God, we can desire, we do desire something for reasons that are not only our arguments. We could think, I would like God to exist because eternal life is interesting or, uh, and other reasons, or I would not like God to exist because perhaps I would have to change something in my life. And so the desire is involved in all cases, in any case. A good example would be Nietzsche. If I were gods, how could I endure it to be no god, therefore there are no gods? It's a good summary. Of course, you, uh, there are other levels of saying the same thing. And on that uh, basis of the impact of desires on what we think about God, that applies to what has been called by others than me and by me also dogmatic atheism. <laughs>
take Bertrand Russell in his, I'd say famous, perhaps I'm wrong, debate on the BBC in 1948 uh, about the existence of a God with Father Copleston. Father Copleston takes as a starting point the contingent world. And uh, Russell says, you can't use the word necessary the way you do. It doesn't make sense. And Copleston says, well, do you mean, therefore, that the question about the existence of that, uh, of the whole of his sorry scheme of things, of the whole universe, is, uh, shouldn't be raised? The question? Russell, yes. I don't think there's any meaning in it at all. So let's forget about the question. It is what Anthony flew after he had converted from decades of atheism to a short period of deism before his death, called dogmatic atheism. He said, take such utterances as we should not ask for an explanation of how it is that a world exists. It is here and that's all. It is what Anthony Flew describes as the endemic evil of dogmatic atheism. Of course, not all atheists are like that. Like the Italian philosopher Norberto Bobbio, who said, at the end of my life, as a philosopher, after, the, uh, after so many, many decades trying to find an answer to the most basic questions, such as why is there something rather than nothing, and don't tell me, plain with words, that the question is not meaningful, because it is. I don't have the answer, and it is a humiliation. This is not dogmatic atheism, which is the question of an agnostic. And I'd say that it makes much more sense. Or the Spanish agnostic, Amelia Varcasel, who says, well, in a letter written to another agnostic philosopher, another Spanish woman who is also an agnostic professor of philosophy. She says, although religion is irrational, reason is religious. It is anxious to make systems, and we can't avoid it. And she sees that as something religious, and she doesn't like that, but can't avoid it. This is not dogmatic atheism which is, I'd say, a realistic approach to the difficulty of a question by a non-believer. You might have heard about Mary Eberstadt, some kind of funny American who wrote a book called The Loser Letters, I like that, where he, she claims to be an atheist, although she's not, and write letters about the loser, that means uh, more or less a god, and raises question to other atheists, say, oh, you know, well, I'm very happy that I am an atheist, but they raise questions around. And they said, oh, for instance, they'd say religion is all wishful thinking because it helps us. She said, oh, of course, it is interesting, but, I quote her, the very character of a Judeo-Christian God that has given you such a romp with the adjectives already turns out to be a pretty big problem for the atheist side. The point everybody is missing is that this particular God is hard to live with. So hard that the atheist idea of his having been made up just for the supposed consolation, of it all is just too lol, LOL. The trouble with wish fulfillment is that it raises the question of what atheists wish to do. In other words, do we, bright, want to abolish loser, that's God, for reasons of our, of our own, because that lets us off the hook to do whatever we please in this world. In other words, desires, what we want to achieve, have an impact on what we think about God in any case because the question is too central not to have an impact on more or less everything. That applies to believers and to non-believers. So we must argue on the basis of something else. And it is true that our God does not simply promise us a pleasant life. There is that, but not only. I'm going to conclude. First I summarize and then I add two short elements. The question of God must be studied philosophically, also by theologians, because it can't really be avoided by theologians. When Aquinas speaks about 
some kind of harmony between our reason and revelation, he actually follows what had been said from the second century on by the church fathers. And it makes sense to raise the question of God. It is necessary because God is not pre-evident to us. And because some questions such as, it is only an example, but an example that applies to more or less everything, the fact that the world is contingent, such questions can't really be avoided, although we might also not see them. Without God, in a sense, we would not understand what it means to be a human being because there is something in us which is not completely satisfied with this world. But it doesn't mean that we affirm a third God's existence out of wishful thinking. Then, finally, if we say that there is no God, we can say what we want, but some questions remain. And I will quote Gaudium et Spes 21, speaking about atheists. Meanwhile, every man remains to himself an unsolved puzzle, however obscurely he may perceive it. For on certain occasions, no one can entirely escape the kind of self-questioning mentioned earlier, especially when life's major events take place. To this questioning, only God fully and most certainly provides an answer, as he summons men to higher knowledge and humbler probing. You see, higher knowledge and humbler pro probing. We must accept what we are. And some questions can't be avoided, says the texts. Some questions remain, and remain without answers, said Gaudium et Spes. Let's take two examples. One which is directly implied in the text, the question of suffering and longing for happiness. In his letter Salvifici Doloris, John Paul II said in 1984, what we express by the word suffering seems to be particularly essential to the nature of man. It is as deep as man himself precisely because it manifests in its own way that that depth which is proper to human, it belongs to man's transcendence. You see, suffering points at something. We do not suffer like dogs, although they do suffer. And one of the signs of that is that we raise questions. And I go on in Salvifici Doloris later in the text, where he speaks about why does evil exist, if one can say it like that, why is there evil in the world? He says both in the world, both questions are difficult. When an individual puts them to another individual, when people put them to other people, and also when man puts them to God, for man does not put this question to the world. Even though it is from the world that suffering often comes to him, but he puts it to God as the creator and lord of the world. See the question of suffering. We see that it raises, that it is a religious question, but precisely, it is a religious question. As John Paul II wisely says, we do not ask the world to give an answer to that. We ask God to give an answer. And the question is an obstacle to faith, we know it. On the other hand, without an answer that comes from God, we simply remain an unsolved puzzle, as God in space said, relating to this question. And in the Summa Contra Gentes 371, St. Thomas quotes Boetius, saying, if there is evil, there is a God. For there would be no evil if the order of goodness were taken away, the privation of which is evil, and this order would not be if God were not. In other words, the question of suffering is rela related to some order, moral, metaphysical, er natural, everything you want. Otherwise, there would be no question of that kind. But why is there that order? And this is a question which is related to God. And second question that would remain unsolved without God, I'd say it is, in a sense, the possibility of thinking about the world, the possibility of understanding, of trying to understand the world, which is an important question. St. Thomas says something which he finds in Aristotle, All the things that are in the universe are somehow ordained 
but all do not have the same order. They are not related in such a way that one would not belong to the other, but there is some affinity and order of the one to the other. And then he adds that they are aiming to some common end. But when we try, as we would say nowadays, scientifically to understand the world, we see, and even the ecological crisis has made that a little, a little bit more obvious, things are actually related to each other. You touch one, the others move around. Why is it like that? And if we would not presuppose some order like that, which is somehow related to our reason, we could not, it would be meaningless to start any kind of scientific inquiry. And John Paul II again said, to speak of chance for a universe which presents such a complex organization in its elements and such a marvelous finality in its life would be equivalent to giving up the search for an explanation of a world as it appears to us. In fact, this would be equivalent to admitting effects without cause. In other words, if you say what we see happened by chance, you simply stop thinking if you really see the implication of what you are doing. And I finally quote two physicists, Vera Kistiakowski, who used to teach at the MIT. My acculturation as a scientist makes me uncomfortable with this, but the exquisite order displayed by our scientific understanding of a physical world calls for the divine. Last example, Louis de Breuil, French Nobel Prize holder for physics, says, well, when you discover a natural law, something which uh, helps understand natural phenomena, what are you experiencing as a matter of fact? That you, as a scientist, just introduced into the world a new law, thanks to which others will find it easier? No, what you, what you discover is that it was already there before. And all of a sudden you discover that you uh, have just started a dialogue with an intelligence that was there before you, and thanks to which it is easier to understand the world. And what do I mean with these final examples? Namely, take questions such as suffering and the possibility to understand the world. I mean that without God, such questions really don't make sense. And this is another reason to say why it would not be wise, whether we believe that God exists or not, not to raise a question in philosophy. And I stop here because my time is over and more than that.